Hello friends, I'm the Reverend Terry Peterson, Minister of St. John's in Gurich. Today is Tuesday, the 1st of March. It's five o'clock, so it's time for a bit of Gin and Jesus today. Um, this Shrove Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. Traditionally, pancakes are eaten on this day as a way of using up the things that are forbidden in a Lenten fast. Of course, in the Church of Scotland, we don't prescribe a Lenten fast. Um, though we are invited to observe a Holy Lent to prepare for um, Holy Week and Easter so that we can better follow the crucified and risen Christ by um, repenting, by turning ourselves around and following Jesus in the direction that he is leading us rather than whatever other directions we have chosen to go over the past wee while. Um, so Lent's purpose is to bring us into closer relationship with Jesus so that when Easter comes and he walks away from the tomb out into new life, that we might follow him into newness of life as well. So how you prepare is up to you, of course. Some people choose to take on a prayer discipline of some kind. Others choose to fast from something um, that is sort of coming between them and their relationship with God. Um, some religious leaders ask us to, for instance, follow the lead of the prophets and to fast from injustice and from harsh words and um, things like that, or to take on a practice of giving, of generosity, of almsgiving, or whatever sort of charitable um, donations might come to mind. Some people choose a practice that's somewhere in between, a combination of those things by um, almost decluttering, kind of. So like giving up things in the house that are not helping your life or your spiritual life, and then giving those away either to a charity or to people who will find more joy and use in them. So whatever way you are about to enter the season of Lent, I hope that it becomes a meaningful season in which you draw closer and closer to the one who will lead us into new life. Um, as soon as Easter comes, we'll be walking in newness of life. Though, of course, we are resurrection people. We walk, hopefully, in newness of life all the time. But it's good to have a season when we intentionally focus on repentance and on removing things that block us from living in God's kingdom so that we can be more faithful in days to come. So all of that to say, it's pancake day. <laughs> Have some pancakes, I hope. Um, we always begin this Wine in the Word time by sharing a bit of our life together, our highs and our lows. So I have to tell you, the high point of my day is right this minute when I am sitting here talking to you at five o'clock and it is so bright, like the sun is shining so brightly through the window that I actually had to close the blind in order to make this video and not be squinting at it the whole time. Um, so that means, you guys, summer is coming. Like it's still light at five o'clock and not just a little bit, but the sun is high in the sky and like still shining through my window. So it's, not, it's light, it's not raining, it's not cloudy and the days are getting long. I love it. So uh, it's a great day. It is a great day. The low point of my day today, I think really is just this sort of constant feeling of being overwhelmed that I have about my whole week. This week just really doesn't have any gaps in it um, and I'm not sure how I'm going to accomplish everything and so every time I look at my to-do list I'm just absolutely overwhelmed so if something doesn't get done this week that you were really looking for then please send me a reminder or um, if it's not urgent and <laughs> you can remind me on Monday that might help um, so I apologize if I'm not quick off the mark and getting things to you that you might be looking for, please let me know because everything is just in a shambles in the study right now and I'm sure that I am letting things slip through the cracks that I didn't intend. So that's the low point of my day today and my week really. Um, whatever your own high and low points might be, I hope you will share them with someone. 
it is important for us to build up the body of Christ by sharing our lives together. So please do. Today, I thought we would revisit a little bit of the reading from this past Sunday that I didn't get a chance to talk about really at all. So I'm just going to read the first part of this chapter. We were reading in John chapter 9, um, and this is the New Revised Standard Version. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Now, this story is so interesting for a couple of different reasons, but first of all, I just want us to picture this scene. So Jesus and his disciples are walking along, they're in Jerusalem, and at the end of chapter eight, we learn that um, people had been trying to stone Jesus because of the things he'd been teaching. So it's not like they're out for a leisurely stroll. Like, he's been in danger, um, like, verse, mere verses before this. So, literally, like, earlier in the day, he had been nearly lost his life, right? Um, so, as they walked along, presumably with some um, either trepidation or urgency, he saw a man blind from birth. Now, obviously, the man didn't see Jesus because he's blind, but presumably he's sitting beside the road because it says that he used to sit there and beg. So he'd been blind from birth and he's sitting beside the road and people are giving to him, right? He's asking for charity to keep him alive. And I wonder if you just stop for a minute and think how old is this man when you imagine him? Like what age is he sitting there beside the road? Um, how long has he been blind? Like if he was born blind, are we talking about someone now who's 14 or 40 or 60 or 25? Like how, how do you imagine him? This matters a great deal because later on in the story, after the part that we just read, um, the religious leaders hear his story and don't believe it, and so they call his parents to ask if it's really him. At which point I always wonder why, if, if he has parents, like if he has parents who are close by, why is he having to sit beside the road and beg? So I want for him to be sort of middle-aged, but it's also possible his parents say he is of age, ask him. So it's possible that he's actually relatively recently of age. Maybe he's only 15 or 16. Um, but it's hard to imagine sort of casting out your teenage son to fend for himself. But on the other hand, if people really think that his blindness is because of some sin, then maybe you would want to remove him from your life so that people don't continue to cast aspersions on you. Because the disciples themselves ask, was it him or his parents that sinned? You can see the cats are playing in the blinds. <laughs> um, 
And I'm just like, I always try to imagine what do they think could have happened in the womb that this man would have done? Like, how could he be the sinner in this situation if he was born blind? What would he have done before he was born that would have warranted this kind of punishment? And right there, you can already see that the idea that disability is some sort of punishment for sin breaks down instantly because either the only option is that his parents sinned and so this punishment is either on them and yet he's the one who suffers or that somehow God is punishing him for something his parents did. Um, that's not great either, right? So uh, the whole system is sort of silly when you start to think about it like how can a disability be a punishment for a sin if it's from birth and it's easy then to extrapolate that out like obviously disability is not a punishment for sin like god's not punishing people for sinfulness with disabilities of any kind um particularly not ones that start from birth because that's ridiculous just even asking the question should have made the disciples pause and go wait a second what we're asking makes no sense so um jesus's answer is a wee bit complex because of course in translation we read it in a pretty particular way and in the greek it actually has fewer words so i only learned this recently um that Jesus's answer in the original Greek just says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. It's so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. And there's no punctuation, of course. So if you take out the words that translators have added to try to make it more clear, Remembering that translation is interpretation, and especially if you do something like this, if you add the words, he was born blind to the sentence, then you have decided what um, the phrase, so that God's works might be revealed in him, like what that relates to. Because the word so that, when you said it this way, makes it so that that second half goes with the first half of what they have set up as a sentence. But there are some scholars who suggest that it's better to read it as neither this man nor his parents sinned, full stop. He was born, or it was so that God, or so that, there's no it was, no he was born. It just the next sentence begins with, so that God's works might be revealed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So full stop, there's no sin involved here. New sentence, God's works will be revealed when we or when you or when I or when all of us together do the things that God requires of us. Now, most of John's gospel is about exactly this thing, right? About people hearing and understanding who Jesus is and then doing the things that he would do, like following where he's going. So it would make sense then to say, so that God's works might be revealed, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. And that would actually take away the idea that um, the blindness of this man from his birth is somehow utilitarian to God's glory, which is another problem that we often have when we're talking about people with disabilities, like somehow, um, you know, they are like that their disability has a greater purpose. And often that greater purpose is made out to be to sort of be an inspiration or something like that, or to show us what real love is or whatever. But that's um, not, <laughs> that's not right. It is not really okay for us to make other people into instruments that, that are for our edification in some way. Um, so those of us who are not disabled, who have able bodies, who have typical 
um, minds and development, um, we just don't get to use people who are neurodivergent or whose physical or mental bodies are different than our own as our inspiration or as our sort of teachers or whatever. Like they're human beings, just like we are, made in God's image. All of us are neighbors together and we are seeking God's kingdom together. And it's not to say that God's glory is not revealed in people with disabilities, but rather to say God's glory can be revealed through anyone. All of us are imperfect mirrors of God's glory, but that's still our purpose to give glory to God in every aspect of our lives. Um, but it's not that having a disability makes you more of a mirror in some way. It's that you're often treated differently and if we read this the way some scholars now suggest, then that does take a little bit of that away. Um, that utilitarian sort of disability porn kind of thing that goes on to make us all in it together, right? So that God's works might be revealed, we must do the things that God sent Jesus to do. So... Jesus does. Now remember, at this point, the man hasn't had anything to do with this, as is often typical in interactions with disabled people. He has just been sitting there, and you know he can hear them talking about him. You know he can hear them. First of all, they can't be that far away because they're gesturing at him. And also, his hearing is probably better than many people's. But he can't see them and so since they're not locals he might not know he probably doesn't know who they are they're just people talking about him and then all of a sudden someone is slathering something on his eyes and he won't know what it is like he will not have seen Jesus spit on the ground and make mud and unless people were talking about what he was doing as it was happening, he probably doesn't even know that that's what that is, which does make this a little bit gross. Um, and as uh, a friend pointed out, you should not go and do this because there's no sign here that the man has consented to any of this. It's just happening to him, um, which is another thing that we often do to people with disabilities, right? Like. We just do things to them without actually asking or having any conversation or getting their consent for things that we're planning to do to or for their bodies or minds or spirits or their space or whatever, and it's not okay. So we need to just be more aware of all of that. So Jesus puts mud on his eyes and says, go and wash in the pool and the name of the pool is Scent. So he literally sends the man to the pool of Scent. S-E-N-T, not like smell, Scent. <laughs> Just like go, that kind of Scent. <clears throat> and then he washes and comes back able to see, but Jesus is gone. So he knows his name, but he doesn't actually know who Jesus is. He's never seen him. All he's overheard is this conversation about him, and then he's heard this one sentence direction go and wash in the pool and that's all he knows of Jesus so far and then everyone starts to wonder if it's really him and he explains the story he keeps saying I am the man I am the man which is the thing that Jesus says of course I am he right or I am or I am the light of the world, as he said a moment ago. So we have here this bit of revelation that's coming through this man, um, except nobody sees it. Nobody sees it. And even in the end of the part we read today, he says, like, I don't know where Jesus is or who Jesus is. All I can tell you is that, like, his name is Jesus, and he put mud on me, and now I can see. So that's the bit of the story that I just wanted to really focus on today is what it has to say to us about um, how we treat people in our community who are different and whether we believe 
in truth that God's glory can in fact be revealed through people with all kinds of bodies and all kinds of abilities and all kinds of minds and all kinds of backgrounds. Or if we subconsciously believe that people whose bodies or minds work differently are somehow less or like they are the people we talk about but not to or the people we do things to but not with. And this is a story that I think lends itself to that kind of um, honest self-reflection because if we're not able to include people fully and to know them, this man's neighbors don't even appear to really know him, then are we reflecting God's glory? Are we working God's works while it is day? Um, that's important for us to ponder and to be better at as a society, as a church, and as individuals. So uh, that's enough, I think, for today. So let's take a moment to pray together. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day that you have made. We give you thanks for the community that you call together, a community full of all different kinds of people. We ask that you would give us eyes to see your glory revealed in all kinds of places. And we ask that you would also give us eyes to see ourselves honestly, hearts that are open to new ways of being in order that all your children might be included in their wholeness, in their beauty, in themselves and for themselves, not only for whatever we think they can do for us or we can do for them. We ask your blessing on this night as we enter into the Lenten season tomorrow, we pray for the ability and courage to reflect honestly and return our hearts to your way that we may follow you wherever you are leading. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, I hope you have a lovely evening and that there are pancakes involved in it and I will see you again perhaps later on in the week or perhaps not until Sunday. We'll see how things shape up with the to-do list, but whichever one of those it is, I'll see you soon. Cheers and peace be with you.